Hi, everybody, and welcome to Good Vibes FC. I'm Sam Lewis, coming to you from the Women's Game World Headquarters in Vermont. And I'm Lynn Williams, coming to you from New Jersey, where I'm having an off day. Oh, my gosh, an off day. How are you feeling, Lynn? I am a little sore. It's been the longest I've played soccer, or the amount of minutes I've played, and it feels like a long time, so I am a sore girl. But I know. I'm good. And I also heard that your family was in town. They are here. They live in today, which is sad, but they're here, and it's been so much fun. We've been doing all of the New York things, and my niece is so cute. What are all of the New York things? Well, they went to Ellis Island without me and saw the Statue of Liberty Wow! while I was at training, and then... On what day? Not yesterday, the day before. I met them in the city. They had been like running around at the little island. I think they did a little bit of shopping, did some sightseeing, did some people watching. Fun. We got brunch. Oh, I love that. And your it's your sister and your niece and who else? And my mom. Oh. Girls trip. Oh, and Marley, but he's an intruder of the girls trip. Yeah. Well, he, Marley's one of the girls. Exactly. Jordan did his makeup, so that makes me feel like he's one of the girls. My gosh, that's so cute. My parents were also in town this weekend. It was so much fun. We did so many wholesome activities. Oh my gosh, like what? We went on a bike ride, and we planted flowers in my flower pots. And we walked Finn. Okay, but what kinds of flowers? Oh, pansies, because it's still a little bit cold. And according to my mom, pansies are hardy, so they will survive the cold. You should get tulips. You know what? I have some tulips, but they are not blossoming at the moment. I heard, well, my mother told me, because I (laughs) wanted tulips at my house, but she said tulips, the only way they come up every year is if the ground freezes. So I feel like that would be a great location because doesn't it get really cold there? It does get really cold here. So yeah, it sounds like I should plant some tulip bulbs next Mm -hmm planting tulip time which we'll have to ask our mothers when that is because lord knows we don't know this is now a flower podcast yes and nothing to do about soccer it's it's just all of our mother's advice on planting (laughs) because we don't actually know but our moms do no idea lynn i also saw your cute picture with your niece jordan your matching sunglasses in your game day pic i know she wanted us to wear those matching sunglasses (laughs) so that was really cute and we just I swear she could be like a little kids model or something. Um, She was having the best time on the little runway. She picked out those shoes. Oh, my gosh. She's wearing, oh, your shoes. Yeah, she picked out my shoes. And we're just, we're just twin besties. I'm also so jealous. Like, you've been wearing Marley's sweaters lately. I know that's Marley's <laughs> vest, sweater vest, because when we were in Australia visiting you guys, he was wearing that. I know. It's been the best thing that's ever happened to me, him here, so I can steal all of his clothes. Oh, my gosh. Well, that's incredible. Okay, so planting and game day fit picks aside, we have a podcast to do, Lynn. Today on the podcast, Kansas City stays on top of the table with another win. Surprise, surprise. But Seattle Rain, on the other hand, they hit last place with another loss. And then we're going to talk about everything NWSL in between. The Champions League final is set for Bilbao, which is in Spain, by the way, in case people didn't know. On May 25th, between Lyon and Barcelona, a rematch of the 2022 final, we are going to get into how the semifinal second legs went down. Plus, we're going to tell you what to watch this week because there's midweek games and this weekend. And we are going to read an email from Rachel and Callie about post-match interactions with opponents. Very spicy. But Lynn, before we get to all of that, We are the self-anointed Doctor Strange and Storm of women's soccer because every match this weekend seemed like it just had like a superhero game changer who saved the day. I don't know anything about Doctor Strange, but I just figured that that was me. (laughs) Yeah, strange dude. So strange girl. And you're Storm because... Because I'm just out there running around causing havoc. Before we get into the NWSL games, this is future Sam here. Hi, everybody. I would need to interrupt this episode with some breaking news. We learned late last night that the U.S. and Mexico withdrew their joint bin for the 2027 Women's World Cup. The context here is that there were three groups up for the bid. The U.S. and Mexico, then a delegation from Germany, the Netherlands, and Belgium, and then Brazil. 
So the U.S. pulled their bid out. There's a lot to unpack here, and the news broke after Lynn and I finished taping. So I actually did an emergency reaction video with Raj last night. Here's some of what we had to say. Oh, brace yourself, though, for an enormous national emotional bummer because news broke this afternoon that U.S. soccer and the Mexican Football Federation have withdrawn their joint bid to host the 2027 Women's World Cup on these very shores. They'll instead focus together on securing the 2031 Women's World Cup. Um, honestly, feels, I don't know how you feel, Sam, I feel devastated, sad day. Um, for all American fans who are looking forward to really the boost, enormous boost that hosting would give to the growth of the women's game in this nation, breaks my heart that like Lily Johannes might have to wait until she's 23 years old to play in a World Cup on American soil. Basically ancient. Uh, I know, Raj. <laughs> it is. It's devastating. It's totally the, funny. It, <laughs> the U.S.-Mexico joint bid was one of three finalists for the 2027 World Cup hosting duties. Brazil are also bidding, as well as a, a combination bid between Belgium, Germany, and the Netherlands. We're going to have to wait a whole 18 days to find out who is winning <laughs> the bid, who is going to be the host. That vote will go down at the FIFA Congress on May 17th in Bangkok, Thailand. This is like Survivor, but for football, Raj. What's going on? You're hooked. You're hooked. <laughs> Telling you, Sam. I just see Survivor everywhere now. <laughs> I've got to say, I have heard strong rumours uh, that FIFA wants this 2027 World Cup to go to Europe, Sam. FIFA president, Johnny Infantino, uh, he's in the United States this very week. It's actually today briefing the soccer caucus in Congress. Uh, yes, Congress has a soccer caucus, which honestly sounds like something that was originally designed to hold the growth of the game back across this nation. But anyway, when a, a, a bidding nation pulls out of such a 2027 bid normally means they're either paid to do so uh, or that they counted the votes they had and realized they were going to fall short. There was no way to win. Yeah, interesting. I I feel like this is a symbol of how little we know, but The Athletic is reporting that Brazil seems to be the favorite to get this bid, considering that Brazil hosted the Men's World Cup in 2014, the Olympics, the Olympics in 2016, and then the Copa America in 2019 and 2021. That having all that infrastructure in place and I guess even just like the experience of that showcasing that they can host a big tournament is a head start for them. I'd also venture to say a consideration for FIFA commercially is that the U.S. is already hosting a bunch of tournaments in upcoming years, including the Club World Cup in 2025 and the Men's World Cup in 2026. There could be some other smaller tournaments in the works there. So could be like kind of an oversaturation of the market in the U.S., which is definitely a commercial consideration for FIFA. But U.S. soccer president Cindy Cohn said in her statement, hosting a World Cup tournament is a huge undertaking and having additional time to prepare allows us to maximize its impact across the globe. I'm proud of our commitment to provide equitable experiences for the players, fans, and all our stakeholders. Shifting our bid will enable us to host a record-breaking Women's World Cup in 2031 that will help to grow and raise the level of the women's game, both here at home as well as across the globe. This entire conversation is available on our YouTube channel at Women's Game MIB. So go watch that when you're done with Good Vibes. But let's get back to the frickin' NWSL. Okay, so I actually want to start our NWSL conversation, Lynn, with the Spirit versus Orlando because I want to talk about Zambian striker Barbara Banda, the latest headlining African striker who's come into the NWSL and made a huge splash. In Barbara Banda's game with Orlando this weekend, she had a hand in all three goals. She scored, she got an assist, and she drew the PK to lead Orlando to a 3-2 to two win over the Spirit. Banda's goal was the 11th goal by an African player in the NWSL this season. Oshuala scored later on in the day to make it 12 goals scored by African players. And we did the math this morning. That's 10% of all NWSL goals this season. When you think about how few African players there are in the league. This stat is even more impressive. So then, Lynn, I started thinking about how this comes into play. And I think it's maybe about how the NBSL is finally a league that's like really coming into its maturity in the same way that like any great player can go to Barcelona or Chelsea or Lyon and make an immediate impact. Now we're seeing that same thing come true in the NBSL. Barbara Banda shows up to Orlando in her first start. She helps create three goals. And it's not that she couldn't have done that in the NWSL before now, but 
there were other factors perhaps limiting this level of player coming to our league. Maybe it was they couldn't get the right salary. Maybe there wasn't enough team support. Maybe they didn't want to come because the coaching or the facilities or the treatment. There were a bunch of decisions that factored into these players deciding to come play for the NWSL now. So I'm getting to my question. I just want to discuss, Lynn, this phenomenon that's happening. Does it feel to you like this is a league that's finally coming into its maturity and is now a league that can support these kinds of international stars on par with clubs like Barcelona and Chelsea? Yeah, I think that one thing that is probably for the player, the biggest piece is just the ability to pay them before when the salary was so low, players were seeking money elsewhere at the end of the day, like this is our job. And you want to make as much money as you can until you have to find your next career. So I think that players are probably looking at that as exciting. And then I do think that the structure around it of having the pieces, not just the coaching staff, but the player and the personnel around you to support said player. Let it be somebody who's feeding them through balls like a great 10 or outside backs who can get them the ball. I think that this league has moved in that direction where it's not just a, for lack of better words, like hodgepodge of players. It's like really intentional of the pieces on each team that they're bringing together to support these superstar players. Yeah, I like totally agree. I think sometimes I think back to some really top level players in name, at least, who came to play with us, whether that was in Western New York or with North Carolina Courage. I remember in Western New York, Lady Andrade, the Colombian Mm -hmm. player who at the time was like one of the top players in the world. She was very heavily sought after. And I just felt like maybe at the time the infrastructure wasn't there. Maybe like the language barrier was a problem or the coaches weren't patient with them. They weren't used to the expectations physically or even the lifestyle. And so I feel like seeing now international players who are thriving consistently in the NWSL. Sometimes there's an adjustment period, but for some of these players we're talking about this year, there's really not. And like you said, Lynn, I do think it's kind of a symbol that the NWSL is just growing like this. All of this is a good sign when good players come here and have success. That's such a good thing for the league. Yeah. I was just going to say, I, I think that you can't put your finger on just one thing, like the one reason why now it seems to be working well, but I do think, like you said, like the language issue, like a language barrier. I think of my team. We have Brazilian, we had Spanish, we had Naho, we had like there's so many different internationals that sometimes you can't even get your point across because you don't speak the same language. But now there's like interpreters that are put in place that we like even in our handbook have put it in a different language. And so they feel like they can be a part of the culture. You're not just like a transplant here. You're actually immersed into the NWSL, into the team. And I think that's like one little step in the right direction. So I think that stuff like that is going so far and going a long way um, in this league. I was also just going to add, like, even like six or seven years ago, the NWSL was still a little bit fragile. Like on any given day, the league could have folded. And now I think it's so established. It's not going anywhere. It's continuing to grow and develop. It's such an exciting time. And I agree that these international players coming here and having the kind of success that they're having is just another kind of building block for this league. And it's a signal to the world that this is a great place to play. I want to get into the Spirit Orlando match. Brazilian Angelina Mm -hmm. opened the scoring for Orlando off a Barbara Banda assist. Banda raced down the right wing to find a ball before it slipped out of bounds. She crossed it in one touch, and it landed perfectly on Angelina's feet. She looped it in. But then the Spirit equalized with a beautiful Ule Sar chip off a Croy Bethune assist in the 40th minute. Croy Bethune, who we talked about last week, is a rookie out of Georgia. And she's having an incredible start to her season for the Spirit. She now has three goals, and she's notched her first season assist. But the goal scorer, Ule Sar, has two goals. She's the veteran French striker who signed on with the Spirit last summer. And she's started to find her form this season up top with Croy and Joni Rodman. Then in the 51st minute, Barbara Banda, the reason why we're having this whole conversation, she scores her first NWSL goal in her second ever NWSL appearance, a header after a deflection on a corner kick. Moments later, Banda got on the ball in the box and she was swept down, earning a penalty for Orlando that Summer Yates converted to make it 3-1 to to the Pride. The Spirit ended up notching one back with an Ashley Hatch goal and Orlando went down to 10 players after a second yellow on Brianna Martinez saw her sent off. But 
The Pride held on. They're still undefeated, and they're tied on points in second place with 12. Obviously, Barbara Bandolin, she was the superhero of this game. What superhero is she? I think she's like Captain Marvel because she's just out here kicking ass. She's out here kicking ass. I just want to talk about her goal for one second. Yes. Like the amount of power she got on that <laughs> header. I know. The ball was like, if people don't know, like, if, if the ball is looped in and has no power on it, you have to put power on it. And if the ball has power on it, you just need to like get a touch on it. Yeah. This ball, it looked like had zero power on it for, and she, I was like, that was a rocket she, header. It was, she How? like used her, like, do you remember you used to do those um, header drills where you'd like lay on the ground and just use like your neck and then you'd like your neck go on your yeah. knees and you'd just use like your core to get power. Like it looked like she's been doing like the knee drills, like getting core and neck power on her headers i was literally like that was a rocket header yeah it was pretty sick out of nowhere i know it was sick i was like whoa go on girl i know use that use that core okay so this is my next question lynn orlando's honestly no offense but kind of struggled since their inception as a club but barbara banda said after their game about the team quote we are working together we fight together we don't want to let one another down it seems like Orlando is, like, figuring out their chemistry, which is, mm -hmm. like, the most important thing. I think chemistry is even more important than having big names, say, players, and signing. So let's just talk a little bit about how teams are creating chemistry within a roster. I think that what you said is correct. Like, you, you can't just bring in big-name players if they don't work well together. And I think that... In a team, you have to have superstars and you have to have worker bees. And that's how it works. You have to have people that when you give them the ball, they are like the most creative, fluid, incredible players. But then you need to have support around them. You can't have 11 superstars on the field. It's yeah. just, in my experience, that's like never been successful that way. And it seems like Orlando right now is finding that chemistry of, mm -hmm. okay, we, who are our workers and who are our, our superstars? And that doesn't mean the worker bees aren't superstars either. And it doesn't mean that the superstars don't work hard. It's just, I feel like that balance of the two is, like I said, in my opinion, how you have the best teams. Yeah. I think it's also when those players know their role. Like I think that mm -hmm. having role players is so important. Like when your mm -hmm. first sub off the bench is pissed that they're a sub. That's yeah. not good for the team. But when they're like, I'm the first sub off the bench. This is my job and I'm going to go out there and I'm going to do it. That gives everybody kind of like clarity and pride in what their job is for the team, which I think is so important. It's, it's not only like having players fill these different roles, but it's having them want to yeah. fill the, whatever role that th is required of them. And when players have pride in that, I think it just helps with the chemistry so much. Yeah, I, I think to your point too, the teams that I've been on that have been the most successful is you are able to live into that role yeah. and you know that your role is important, even if it's not necessarily the role that you saw for yourself. For example, like if, if I'm playing and I can't go to another forward on the bench to say like, what are you seeing in the game? What can I do better? It's not going to help me. It's not going to help the team either. And I think that that's what we have to remember. It's, it's a team sport of like, what do you see? And vice versa, if I'm on the bench and I'm so upset that I'm not playing and somebody comes and says, Lynn, what do you see? And I'm so salty that I'm like, I'm not going to tell you. Yeah. It's, it's just not helpful. So I think that that is a huge piece of like knowing your role and being able to live into that fully and just embrace it and embody that. I think that's how you have the best teams. Yeah, for sure. Well, speaking of superstar roles, we have one more piece of big news coming out of this match. Marta, the legendary Brazilian striker, announced this week that she was retiring from international football with 116 international goals, six Women's World Cups, six FIFA Player of the Year awards. Marta's played in five Olympic Games and hopefully will be at this summer's tournament in Paris if she's selected. That would be her sixth. And final international appearance for Brazil, according to her. So this is our Olipop Gut Check of the Week, Lynn. It's brought to you by our wonderful friends at Olipop. Oh, oh, nice. Yeah, Marta has been of every era. She's been playing internationally since the early 2000s. She's played against all of these career greats, like 
been up against players from 20 years ago, but then also has been playing against us for years in the NBCL and for Brazil. We have to just determine, is she the greatest of all time? Well, first of all, is like six her favorite number? Like 116, six. six World Cups, six FIFA, like she might go to six Olympics. Oh my God. I have a, an incredible Marta story. Hit us. When we were playing against her, she was at Orlando. We were in North Carolina. She was pinned on the sideline. It was her V2 of us. And our coach was screaming, it's a handball, it's a handball. And she, with her foot on the ball, looked over at him, wagged her finger and said, no, it wasn't. And then megged us and then just scurried off dribbling away. Yeah, like while the ball was still in play. While it was still in play. And I remember looking at it and was like, as a spectator of the game, that was incredible. As a member of North Carolina, I am so sad to watch that happen. (laughs) (laughs) I was like, that was incredible. For her to basically pause the game mid-play and say, no, that wasn't a handball, and now I'm going to meg you and show you that it wasn't a handball and go away. I know. But it, that, that's, like, the thing is, like, <clears throat> there are so few players like Marta, but it's, like, she can pause the game because you don't want to, like, lunge in and try to tackle her because you're, like, I'm going to get megged and, like, wind up watching her run away from me. I remember I was in a one-on-one situation with her when I played on North Carolina – And I just let her dribble at me for 30 yards because I was like, I'm never actually going to engage with you because it's going to be so embarrassing. So just pass it. Like, I'll let you pass it. Just pass it. I want to just really quickly, Lynn, name a couple other GOAT potentials, greatest of all time potentials. Abby Wambach, Christine Sinclair, Carly Lloyd, Brianna Scurry, Kelly Smith, Michelle Akers, Sawa. Lots of options here. But the Olipop Gut Check of the Week kind of requires us to give an opinion. So, Lynn, I think because, like you said, Marta has been doing it for so long and such a high level through the 99ers and now us, like that is a long time to stay at a high level. I obviously wish she could play forever. But yeah, I'm going to have to go with Marta. I think that she is the goat of all goats. I agree, Lynn. I think that for Marta's like longevity and even like just how superior she was, especially at the height of her career. I have to go right now, Marta Goat. All these other players obviously have, in different categories, I think that they are the best to ever do certain things. Like Abby Wambach, best goal scorer with her head. Pretty pretty goat at scoring goals with her head. I think like other players are the best at other things, but Marta's ability to play at such a high level for so long and to just be so freaking good and scary to play against for so long... Marta, goat, goating it up. Yeah, you're like, I'm going to force Marta right because I know she wants to use her left foot and somehow she still uses her left foot. I know. She like back does it with her left foot behind her right leg. You're like, what's happening? I know. I'm sorry. I just have to say like I'm laughing because we created this list like just out of nowhere. And then and then now you're defending the list of like, uh, we're not trying to offend you, but... <laughs> Like, we created it and now we're defending it. I know. Okay, sorry. I know. I'm. You know me. I'm always I'm always just sitting with one foot on both sides of the fence. But the Olipop gut check of the week does not allow me to do that. So here we are saying that March is the goat. We're so <laughs> honored to have played against her. She's retiring from international soccer, but hopefully it's after we see her at the Olympics this summer. This segment was brought to you by our besties at Olipop. Let us know in the comments who you think the all-time women's soccer goat is. Is it Marta? Let's chat about a few other NWSL games from this past weekend. Angel City versus the Kansas City Current. They played in LA. It was a 3-1 to win for Kansas City with a really nice long-distance goal from one of my MVP frontrunners, Vanessa DiBernardo. The win would be sealed by two late Kansas City goals in the 90th and again in the 93rd from Claire Lavage. In other big news, Dubinia returned from injury and she made an immediate impact setting up the game winner. Deb coming back onto this team, this Kansas City team who's already so dangerous. Now she's joining up with DiBernardo and Chewinga and Zanarato. I feel like Kansas City has already been so successful in their attack, but now they have Deb back, Lynn. Yeah, I think that looking at them and their attack, it's pretty scary. But my hope is that as a fellow WSL 
player against her. <laughs> Can't think of the words. Opponent. <laughs> exactly. Opponent. I think the big question for everybody is to figure out a way to stop Kansas City from scoring so many goals. Like, they just are racking up multiple goals every yeah. game. Dabinia, we're giving her the superhero of this game for Kansas City. And I feel like I want to call her Iron Man. She's just, like, always involved in everything. Dabinia, when she's out there... She's really, really so fun and incredible to watch. So she's yeah. definitely going to bolster this Kansas City attack that really doesn't need bolstering. <laughs> Claire Emsley did score again for Angel City, and that's her fourth goal of the season. She's tied for the second highest NBC goal scorer this season, alongside Bia Zanarato, Temo Chuinga, and Uchenna Kanu. First place is held by Sophia Smith of the Portland Thorns. No surprises there. Kansas City are still undefeated. Top of the table, four points clear. Besides, well, kind of already answered it. Kansas City, we need to find a way to stop them from scoring. We. Who am I? (laughs) The rest of the league needs to find a way to stop Kansas City from scoring goals. How are people going to do that? Yeah, I think that when you look at them, they have so many pieces that, like I said, it's kind of scary. Just starving the goal scorers of the ball, Mm. if that makes sense. Like figuring out who's feeding them and then how do you make sure that person doesn't get it? Yeah. Yeah. And then when you're playing against fast players, you have to, like, bump them, make contact, make sure they're not just allowed to run freely, and then getting support around the ball. I think that every time you play Kansas City, it seems it's going to be a hard, tough game, and so you have to just be up for the battle. Lynn, you're absolutely right. The Current are heading to Houston this weekend where they will look to keep scoring an insane amount of goals. Last match of the weekend was Sunday night. It was Lynn's Gotham versus Louisville in New Jersey. It finished one to one and Katrine Berger, your new goalkeeper who just transferred from Chelsea, she started for Gotham. Lynn, what is it like integrating a new goalkeeper into your team? Yeah, I think she's actually done a great job of just like getting in there. She landed and was with the team and immediately traveled to Washington last weekend. She obviously didn't play, but she was on that whole trip. I got to go to dinner with her and just get to know her a little bit more as a person. She like, has a very calm presence about her, which mm. I think is incredible in a keeper the keepers are crazy people I don't know why you want to be throwing your body around and (laughs) having balls kicked at you but it is great to know like how what a calming presence she is and just her ability to study and know the game like when we got back from Washington we were watching film and she just immediately inserted herself of her opinion of how the team could be better defensively what's going on here and there and and just she's a veteran player and Mm -hmm. she exudes veteranness about her yeah and I think that Rose said this, and I completely agree. Having a keeper like her, I think, will directly affect our offense and make our offense better. Because when you're in training and you score a goal on her, you're like, that was a good goal. Yeah. You know that like it had to be a banger to get past her. And I think that that will make our our whole offense just a better offense. So I'm really excited to um, just continue to play with her and see what she can do. I mean, she had a couple of huge saves. And one of them, she like jumped so high and just like caught the ball where I think most keepers would just like parry the ball wide. She just like caught it. Mm. And I was like, that was crazy. So I'm excited. Yeah, that sounds incredible. She made a couple of huge saves in your game. Lynn, you've also been wearing the captain's armband the past couple of weeks. Can you tell us a little bit about what playing that role is like for you? Yeah, so we have like a leadership group and I'm not like the team captain. That's Michelle Betos. But we have like basically how the team voted whoever's like next up will get the armband and I feel very honored that the team voted me in and just you know has faith and trust in me to be able to lead the team I think that in just my growth as a soccer player and as I've matured you have to be able to like get outside of yourself I think when you're really young like a new player you're like okay, what do I need to do to perform well what do what I need to do what do I and it's all about you just just until you learn how to get that down. But I feel like since I've been doing this for so long, I know what I need. And now how can I use my voice and use my veteranness to help others and see what maybe if something's going wrong in the game, say like, okay, how can I impose my knowledge onto others? So it's been really like exciting. I like it. And now I'm just, I think, also learning how to talk to the ref, not in just uh, screaming at them all the time. (laughs) So that's like... (laughs) An evolution of, okay, how do you stay calm and get what you want while also just not screaming at them? Yeah. Well, in this game in particular against Louisville on Sunday night, the ref was pretty involved in the game. There were like a couple of injuries. There were a lot of fouls. And I did see you and Emily Sonnet at one point having 
what looked to be a very mature conversation with the ref, but in a stalemate like this, Lynn, like the ball wasn't really bouncing you guys' way. It seemed like maybe like a little bit of a frustrating game. Like what's a game like this feel like for you? Frustrating. I think that especially when you look at that game in the first, I would say 30 minutes, we were all over them and not having the ball bounce your way. It kind of, you've put like, you know, sometimes when you don't put your chances away, you're like, you are just setting the other team up for like having a moment where if you don't put away your chances, they can continue to get a chance and chance and chance. And you have to almost be perfect in your defense. And so I think that's the most frustrating part as, as a forward unit, our job is to score goals. And when that's not happening, how do you stay calm and not get so frustrated? And how do you continue to help your defense out at the same time? So I think that looking at this game versus our past games, it's a step in the right direction. But obviously, that's an area we need to improve on. And, and either is it being more patient around the goal? Take, is it more taking more shots, mm. taking more chances, being more aggressive? Um, and that's something I think that we need to look at this week and say, okay, how do we continue to create but also picking the right moments to shoot. Yeah. Well, something I think is definitely going to make this easier for you guys is having Rose Lavelle back. Big moment from the game. Lynn, you were subbing off. Rose Lavelle, new Gotham signing, makes her debut in the 74th minute. This is Rose's first appearance in a Gotham shirt. She's been dealing with an injury after the Gold Cup. Lynn, you and Rose were, like, switching. Can you walk us through the moment? Like, did Rose step on the field a little bit early? Like, what was going on out there when you subbed off for Rose to come on? Oh, well, first of all, I think she was a little excited, just got right on there. Um, But I, you know, we were were tied. So she's like, you got to get off, Lynn, and I got to come on because the time is dwindling. I also was like, I need to give this Captain Arms band to somebody, but I didn't know who. So I was like, somebody take this from me. (laughs) So it was like a little bit of a, like a shit show there, but it's okay. But yeah, I'm super excited for Rose to be back. Everybody who's played against or played with Rose, like, You know, if you're playing with her, you're like, wow, what an incredible player. She can create anything out of nothing. And if you're playing against her, you're you're like, why? Like, please stop running at me. Like and stop freaking chasing back on defense. Yeah. She chases back on defense like nobody I've ever seen. Except maybe you. Like you do the same thing when you just get it in your head that you're like, I'm getting this. And you'll like make up a the person has a 20 yard head start and you just go hunt them down. It's wild. Yeah, you're like, give it back to me. Yeah. I give it back. She just has um a roseness about her that is so unique to her. And I just like can't wait to play with her. I hopefully coming up, we won't be on restricted minutes so we can just play together. That's the goal. Well, Rose clearly, this was the easiest one we had to come up with, is Deadpool because she's the comic relief, but she's also just a freaking absolute ninja out there. Rose ends up being the superhero yeah. for Gotham of this game. But before we get to her goal, we're in stoppage time. Lynn, you're now on the bench. It's the 95th minute. Emma Sears creates a goal for Louisville after showcasing her speed down the wing. And Raylan Turner scores. It's one to nothing Louisville with just a few minutes left in stoppage time. What are you thinking from the bench? Well, I'm thinking that's unfortunate. I, I'm also thinking I would have to go back and rewatch it now. But is it a goal? Was Delaney off the field? Like, I need to know if she was offside or not. Like, I'm not convinced it was a goal still this morning. Oh, uh- controversy (laughs) but when after the VAR that got checked I think all of us were thinking okay that sucks but there's still time we have 10 minutes of stoppage time so 10 minutes is enough time for us to get a goal and I think that with just the fresh legs and the like we like to call them game changers all the game changers that came on we were still fighting and I think at that moment the game was so wide open that I I was like we just need one opportunity like we just need to keep serving at one opportunity and we're gonna get one back so it wasn't a feeling of oh my gosh we're defeated it was a feeling of like no grind and dig deep and we're gonna we're gonna get one back yeah well you did moments later Deadpool Rose Lavelle gets it back for Gotham in her debut game Louisville goalkeeper Lund can't get a hold of a ball which finds its way to Rose's feet and she bangs it in off the right post leveling up the game This one always felt like it was going to be a tie, like you guys were tied 0-0 for so long. So this is Rose Lavelle plus the soccer gods just being like, this game needs to be a tie. Is that what you think, Lynn? Yeah, I think so. But I also think it's like maybe the soccer gods being like, yeah, you guys deserve one. Maybe. I feel you. Sometimes (laughs) the soccer gods do the right thing. 
Yeah. Sometimes they don't. But let's jump across <laughs> to Europe. We're changing it up. We're going to talk about the Champions League semifinals, which had their second legs this past weekend. The final is now set. The Champions League final is going to be Barcelona versus Lyon. So how did we get here? Chelsea hosted Barcelona. They were up one to nothing on aggregate at a sold out Stamford Bridge for the first time ever for the Chelsea women. And the last time at the iconic stadium for Emma Hayes. Eitana Bonmati scores for Barca to make the aggregate one to one. Eitana received the ball just outside the box. She touched it forward, beat her defender, and then she found just a nice little window of space to shoot with her right foot far post. There was a slight deflection, but brilliant play from Eitana Bonmati, who was the game changing superhero of this game. Her superhero, Lynn. Wonder Woman, which I think is maybe even easier than the Deadpool reference. I know. Pretty straightforward. Aitana Bomati, yeah. Wonder Woman, duh. So, Kadisha Buchanan then got her second yellow card on a harsh call by the referee. So, Chelsea have to play with 10 players for 30 minutes of this game. Remember, it's one to one on aggregate. Lynn, teams prepare for moments like this to go down mm-hmm. a player. How devastating is it? in a hugely important moment like this, to lose a player against arguably the best team in the world, Barcelona? I think it's devastating. That's the correct word. When you're already down a goal, but you're also tied one-to-one, and knowing that you have to keep it, you can't get scored on again. You have to just stay at this moment to, to at least make it to PKs and get through the game but also knowing that they seem to have the momentum. I think at that moment, your momentum's not on your side, and then you get a red card. As a player, I think you're already in a hole, and you're trying to dig yourself out of a hole, and then you get put into a little bit of a deeper hole. So even though you've prepared for these moments, you need one thing to try to change the momentum, and I'm assuming it felt like everything was getting stacked against them. So I don't know how you change that in that moment. It takes, I think, a couple people to rally together. And unfortunately, I don't think that we saw that. I know. I think what you're saying is very true. Like this moment is, the momentum changed a lot. Like how could it not? I think Chelsea is fighting to stay in this game and to then to lose a key player, a defender. Mm -hmm. Of course the momentum changes a little bit. So then just a little bit later, Bon Mati for Barcelona goes down in the box. She earns a PK. Fridolina Rolfo converts it. And Barcelona end up winning this game 2-1 to one on aggregate. And they go through to the Champions League final. There was a lot of talk about this call, the momentum change. There was another dramatic post-game press conference with Emma Hayes who said, I thought that was the worst decision in UEFA Women's Champions League history. I'm gutted for the players. We were robbed. She also went on to say... I genuinely believe we were on top of the game. We just hit the post. I could feel the momentum going in that direction, but we didn't have the chance to experience that. You need everything to go your way. They get two yellow cards, a deflection, and a penalty. Everything went their way, and everything didn't go our way tonight. I think that is so true. In a game like this, where the margins are so small, you do need some things to go your way. I always say this about our 2019 World Cup run to the final things went our way when the margins again they're just so small so sometimes you need a little bit of luck Mm -hmm. sometimes you need a call I think it's just such a difficult moment to be in emotionally Emma's final statement was the toughest thing to take is that we didn't lose it there's nothing you can do when there's such a terrible decision it's already hard enough they are a top team when it's taken out of your hands that is a tough one on the players for sure I did just want to quote also that the future Washington Spirit manager, current Barcelona manager, Jonathan Geraldes, responded saying that it's part of the game. The most important thing is the management of emotions when you're winning, when you're losing. We were better than Chelsea. We deserved the win. I think that's my general takeaway from this. This is the most important game. It's the Champions League semifinal. It's an emotional time. So, Lynn, yeah. generally in a game where you're not getting calls going your way, How do players manage that? How do coaches manage that? Is it kind of the manager's job to be the voice of the players and advocate for their team? What's your takeaway from just heightened emotions in a game where there is some controversy? Yeah, I think, like you said, like before you even step on the pitch, your emotions are already high. Like, you know, this is a big game. You know exactly what you need to do to move on to the next round. 
And so when things start to go and happen, I think it you look to your manager and then you look to your senior players. We always talk about living in that like that optimal zone. Like you your emotions can't get too high when you're winning in a positive way right. and you can't get too low negatively if things aren't going your way. It's like living in that optimal zone. And so I think that Barcelona did a great job of even when things were going their way, sometimes you can like get too excited, you know, mm-hmm. and you're like, oh my gosh, it's happening for us. And then you stop playing and mm-hmm. they just like continued to ride the wave and just were like, whatever call happens, happens. And I think that that's as hard as it is where Chelsea kind of fell instead of saying like, okay, you got a yellow. Okay, we got scored on. Like, how do we continue to go? Because Chelsea's a great team, you know, and if they could just stick to their game plan and and play and not let those emotions, not let the ref affect the game, I think that they might have had more of a fighting chance. But it's tough. I mean, when when the ref's making calls that aren't going away, it's really tough to to keep a level head when you're like, why are you trying to dictate the game? Yeah. Well, and I so I think that's where I want to get a little more into this second yellow card specifically with Kadisha Buchanan, who kind of came through to tackle the ball, did Mm -hmm. step on the Barcelona player's foot and had maybe had her arm up a little bit. My opinion, Lynn, in a vacuum, is this a foul? Yes. Is it a yellow? Maybe not all the time. Like on its own, if this was just Mm -hmm. a one-off foul, would it be a yellow card? I don't think it's clearly a yellow or clearly not a yellow. I think it's like kind of subjective depending on who you're cheering for and where the ref is standing. Obviously there's yeah. no, no VAR review for a yellow card. So I think my question is, in your opinion, is this foul worthy of a yellow card on its own? I think it was a really soft yellow, like even on its own. I think that they're both going for the ball. I think that, yes, she steps on her foot, but it's not even like in a dangerous manner it's just like oops jabbed ya yeah she was like lunging for the ball yeah which happens all the time like that doesn't even get called as a foul and so I think that when you're looking at it like that she she's on a yellow already I like to think about it in the sense of if people watch the um, final four Iowa against UConn Paige Beckers has the ball or was taking the the buzzer beater shot and the ref calls it and so it it like kind of stops the game right there. And the ref had decided that Iowa was going to go on. And so I think that this is kind of one of those moments. Obviously, it's not so close to the end of the game, but you are making a game-changing decision of taking a person off the pitch. And so I think if you're looking at it holistically, looking at the moment, looking at the the severity and the 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 big moment of this game – can you just go up to her and say, hey, you're on a yellow. You need to be careful here. Do you have to give her another yellow? I think that those are decisions that, in my opinion, the ref got wrong. So you're saying that <clears throat> whether or not this individual foul instance mm-hmm. is a yellow card, we're not in a vacuum. The ref yeah. is the one deciding these huge moments of the game. And maybe a solution for the ref would be to just go up to Kadisha Buchanan and say, look, you got a yellow five minutes ago. I'm warning you. I could give you another yellow. Take it easy. If that, if it's even warranted by that foul, which, again, I think it's arguable. Was that and foul so bad it even warranted a conversation? I don't know. But That's what I'm saying. I think that that is the difference. If Kadisha Buchanan yeah. came in and was like, just yeah. smacked into her, you're like, okay, come on. You got a yellow five minutes ago. I think your point, which is really important here, is that it's not in a vacuum. And the ref, Mm -hmm. what we're hinging this conversation on is like, should the ref take into consideration that Kadisha Buchanan just got a yellow card, that this is the Champions League semifinal, that the game is tied, and that this decision is going to have a huge impact on the rest of this game? Or should the ref make a call as she sees it in a vacuum? I think that's like a question for a referee committee. Like, what should, should the ref let the emotions come into her decision? I don't know. I think that you have to look at it holistically because I think if you start doing that, luckily in this game it didn't happen, but you can start to lose control of the game. I think that other Chelsea players can, like the game could actually start getting dangerous knowing that emotions are already flying high. Mm. And so I think that 
especially in a situation where sometimes that wouldn't even be called a foul. So when the the call, in my opinion, is so soft, a yellow that's so soft, you, I think even more you have to take into consideration the whole entirety of the game. Like I said, if Kadisha came in and was just like, just took her out, then you're like, all right, you didn't listen to my yellow five minutes ago. Like, this has to be another yellow. But in this instance, she's they're both going for the ball. It's not dangerous at all. She gets her. She gets the top of her toe. Yeah. Trust me, it hurts like that. It's painful, but it's not like a. I agree with you, but I wonder if another consideration here is the consistency of the referee's calls. Like the ref did give out mm. some yellow cards and apparently is known for being a little bit card happy. If she's consistently calling the same type of foul and the same type of yellow card, does that speak to the validity of this call? That it wasn't just a soft yellow uncharacteristic of the referee's subjectivity. Like she gives out yellows a lot. So maybe the players should have been more careful. One, I would have to like go back and rewatch the whole game to know like what yellow she gave out or what calls she made. So like, I can't speak to that. I think that I find it hard hard when you know a ref is going to be giving out a lot of yellows because at what point is the ref again dictating the game and not letting you just play? Uh, Because then you, as a player, like this is a contact sport. What can I touch and what can I touch? Yeah. This is a really, really hard one. I think as like a non-biased bystander, like I don't know what the right answer is here. I agree with Lynn. I think it was a really harsh situation to have happen for Chelsea. I feel bad for them. I do think that Barcelona deserve a chance in the Champions League final as well. So sometimes this is just the game. I do think that Barcelona played a great game. I think that they, on the day, were the better team. But I just thinking of putting myself in that situation and being Chelsea, I would have said that was a harsh call. Yeah, I agree. And so that's where my... I feel for them um, yeah. in in the sense that like when, like I said, if you're already in a hole, you're feeling like, okay, we just have to hold on to this. And then, and then that moment happens on such, in my opinion, a soft yellow. You're like, we can't catch a break. Yeah. I mean, incredibly frustrating for Chelsea and Emma Hayes, whose Champions League title remains her white whale. Lynn, are there any like trophies or awards or, Like, what's your white whale? Is something in your career that's just eluded you and that you have to just be like, or you're waiting to have happen? Well, I I would have loved to win a World Cup or an Olympics. So those are my white whales. Well, those could both still happen, Lynn. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, when we're thinking about like NWSL, I feel like I feel very fortunate to have done all of the things that you can do in the NWSL. (laughs) NWSL MVP, NWSL Shield, NWSL Championship. Yeah, I feel very fortunate for that. I I would just have to say a a World Cup or or an Olympic gold medal. Like, I think that those are the two things that have not gone my way. Do you have one? I do. I, the Olympic gold, definitely. Yeah. I only had one chance to play in Champions League and we just freaking blew it, which will always haunt me. But we did lose to Barcelona, which in retrospect, it's like, fair enough. They were so good. So... Emma Hayes does have one more chance to win the league title of the WSL. The WSL final match day is May 18th, and that could be the day that the title's decided between Man City and Chelsea. But there's still a few games before that. Anything could still happen. We will plan to see Emma in her first game with the U.S. Women's National Team on June 1st against South Korea. But we had another semifinal amidst all of this for the Champions League. PSG hosted Lyon. Lyon had shocked PSG in the first leg, snatching a 3-2 victory after being down 2 to nothing. So PSG had a little gap to close, but Lyon went up early 1-0 to nothing on a Salma Baca goal. They were up 4-2 to on aggregate and seemingly out of reach for PSG from here. Salma Baca was the superhero of this game. Because she scored two minutes in, Lynn, we got to call her the Flash. Yeah. Western New York Flash. The Western New York Flash, Salma Baca. PSG did get one back from Malawian striker Tabitha Chewinga. Yes, she is the sister to Temwa Chewinga. Right before halftime, 4-3 to three on aggregate. But Lyon would not be denied. They ended up scoring again. Melchi Dumornay against a disorganized and a little bit fragmented PSG backline. So that semifinal finished 5-3. to three. Lyon go through. The Champions League final will be Barcelona versus Lyon. The two most storied clubs in European women's soccer. It's a tale as old as time. 
They've played each other in the Champions League final twice, 2019 and 2022. Lyon won both times. Barcelona has taken the Champions League in 2021 against Chelsea and then again in 2023 against Wolfsburg. So that game, Barca versus Lyon, is on May 25th at 12 p.m. This also, funnily enough, is kind of the Michelle Kang derby. The spirit owner also owns Lyon. And then the head coach of Barcelona, Jonathan Geraldes, is coming to the spirit when he finishes at Barcelona. So Michelle Kang just kind of running the show of women's soccer out here all over the globe. Yeah, she's, uh, it's a win-win for her. Yeah, right? We're going to give you more of a preview of that Champions League final in the weeks ahead. But back to the WSL. Chelsea are playing Liverpool midweek this week on Wednesday to attempt to close the gap with their two games in hand while trailing Man City by six points. Man City did win their game this weekend against Bristol City, 4 to nothing, confirming Bristol's relegation. This was tied until late, and it ended up really opening up for City as they scored four goals. Crystal Palace also saw their promotion dreams come true this weekend, and they'll be joining the WSL next season. This Sunday at 9.15 a.m., the match that could help determine the WSL champion, Man City has to play Arsenal. This is definitely City's most difficult match in the run, and any dropped points could tilt the scale in Chelsea's favor. Plus, City are without Bunny Shaw, so the team needs goal scorers to step up. Coming up the next few weeks, we have some midweek games. This Wednesday night, May 1st, we have three matches. Lynn, you have a mid-game week next week, but this is the start of the NWSL having two weeks in a row with midweek games, which just means that a lot of players are about to have three-game weeks. Can you tell us what it's like to have three games in one week? Yeah, first of all, I think as a fan, that's really exciting. But as a player, I think... It's tough. And I think that it's an added stressor depending on where you're playing. Mm-hmm. So for us, we we play home on the 4th, but then we travel to Houston on the 8th and then we go to San Diego on the 12th. So we're going to be on the road for the week and then also adding in time zones as mm-hmm. well. So now you're trying to like get on the time zone, making sure that the whole, like eating right and sleeping and all the things, which I think is like a, just an added stressor on your body. And it might f- seem like a one-off. Like I know in the past we've had more Wednesday games and this year I think we only have two weeks of mm-hmm. Wednesday games. And so I think if you're just looking at the NWSL schedule, you're like, oh, it's okay. Like you- you'll be fine. It's just one Wednesday game or two Wednesday games. But when you're adding in these other tournaments that we're having to play in, those Wednesday games start to add up. And we've talked about this before, but until the infrastructure of the NWSL can meet the demands of midweek games, it's really tough on the players. We're not like pr- flying private. We're in sometimes middle seats going really far. It's different than Europe where you it's like small trips. Like we're going all the way to the West Coast, tr- trying to travel uh, massage therapists. Mm-hmm. And some teams have, who knows if like a lot of injuries, like can your uh, medical team support that? And I just think it, it's really tough on teams. So we'll see, but those aren't excuses. You got to get the job done. Yeah, I think totally. You guys definitely want to come away from this run of games with points. I mean, thinking about there's nine points yeah. available in any given week is incredible, but I think balancing yeah. the calendar with players' needs, considering uh, there have been a lot of injuries lately. Like, I think this is all part of a larger conversation, scheduling, resources, travel, Mm -hmm. something that we're bound to be talking about a lot this year. A couple of other games. Orlando are playing North Carolina, and Orlando will seek to stay unbeaten at home. We will see if Barbara Banda can help keep up that streak. Chicago are playing Washington. Both teams suffered losses at the weekend and will want to bounce back. Historically, I feel like if you hold Mal Swanson back from scoring in a game the next game, she's probably going to sneak one in there. And then Bay are playing Portland. Portland heads south to take on the Bay, who have scored a lot this season, but haven't been on the right side of the score lines, really. Sophia Smith has been on an absolute tear at the front for the Thorns, and Becky Sauerbrunn has held strong at the back the past two games, so we're going to be talking to Becky about that one next week. Also, don't forget midweek, Chelsea are playing Wednesday as well. They're going to visit Liverpool at 2 p.m. It's a must-win for them. We can all take work off early on Wednesday, I think. Then at the weekend... Friday night at 10 p.m. Eastern, Seattle are hosting the Wave. Both of these teams haven't quite found their form yet this season. The Rain are in last place. They're on just three points. With Alex Morgan still on an ankle injury, it's unclear when she'll be back. So the Rain might have an opportunity to go up and start turning their season around. Saturday night, Gotham hosts the Courage. 
And guess what, Lynn? I'm coming to your house and coming to your game. Are you excited to see me? Yes, girls weekend. Whoop, 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 whoop. Plus Marley, but he's one of the girls. He's one of the girls. And all you good vibers out there, hopefully we will see you there. For me, I don't really know which team to support. Yes, you do. I hope everybody wins. No, you don't. What jersey should I wear? She, ignore those questions. She knows exactly who to support and what jersey she'll be wearing because she'll be staying at my house or on the streets. Okay. Well, it looks like I need to get myself a Lynn Williams jersey. <clears throat> Lynn, I will be texting you to organize that. Rounding it off on Sunday, we have a ton of good games with Houston attempting to shut down the current, Orlando taking on undefeated racing Louisville, and Bay hosting the Red Stars. Sunday morning, don't forget, Man City's playing Arsenal. Nobody's leaving their house on Sunday. We're all under house arrest. Let's go to the inbox really quick. We got an email from Rachel and Callie that asks... We love watching the interactions post-game, especially cross-team interactions. We have always wondered a couple of things. What exactly do you talk about post-game with your opponents? Are you discussing the match or are you catching up like old friends? Maybe making dinner plans later. Would love to know. Thanks so much. We love the podcast. And as Gotham season ticket holders, go Bats and go Lynn. Lynn, Yay. let's say you like lose or tie. Are you going to like go up over to your friend and be like, hey, what's up, sis? Or are you like mad? I think it depends the, on the game and like how the game went, the magnitude of the game. And if you if you like lose and it's like really heated, you might not say hi and you just walk yeah. away and then you like text them later and you're like, sorry, but I yeah. have to go. And I, I think <laughs> that as a friend, you just you're like, yeah, fair enough. Like last night, we obviously tied and I went up to Abby Ursig and I was like, hi, how are you doing? I haven't seen her in a long time. And both of us hug and we're like well that was yeah. frustrating and then we just kind of catch up on how we're doing so there's stuff like that sometimes you like giggle about like what happened in the game especially if say you're I'm sure you did the Sam like if you and Christy went up for the ball yeah. or like you and saw it and you'd be like I can't believe you did that that was so annoying of you I know I think it's like you're obviously always friends but for 90 minutes you're like competitors so you when your friend does something good on the other team you're kind of like oh because you like love yeah. them, but like they're your like enemy for a minute. So you ha it's like annoying that they did it. But as soon as the game ends, you're like, I guess kind of happy for them. So I guess when you go up, you give them a hug. You're either like, ew, you're so annoying, but like, let's hang out. Or if you won, you're kind of like, sorry, but like, not really. Not sorry at all. Yeah. Like if it's a like a final, for example, like the NWSL final, me and Sonic got in this like little oh, yeah. argument at the very end. And then we like didn't say hi to each other afterwards. Obviously, we're excited. I'm like not gonna go rub it in your face. And then after the game, we both like <laughs> she like texted me. She's like sorry, and I'm like yeah, no, it's fine, <laughs> it's fine. And like then you move on. Yeah, you're like I just saw like red in yeah. that moment, but it it just it depends on like the magnitude of I the know. game. Like if it's a final and stuff, you're not gonna like go up and be like I'm so sorry you lost. I, yeah, it's I'd be like, okay, like, get away from me. Great question, yeah. Rachel and Callie. We love that. Anybody, you can write us with questions. You can just send us an email at womensgamemib at meninblazers.com. We've been reading them out loud on the show. The funnier, the better. This is it, Lynn. This is the end of the episode. It's so sad that we're done, but we get to leave our beautiful listeners with a good vibe. Yes. Okay, I'll leave them with a good vibe, but I just wanted to last week's with, my, with me... Um, was it two weeks ago? Whenever I came on here last, they asked what our favorite fast food restaurant was. Yeah. Our chain restaurant. And I completely forgot about BJ's and their oh. Pazookis. And I just need to say that is also one of my favorites because I also saw that Red Lobster is going bankrupt, apparently. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. They had an all you can eat shrimp dish and it's taken the lobsters down. Wait, I'm sorry. Red Lobster put themselves yeah. out of business by serving too much shrimp? That's the word on the street. Yeah. <laughs> what? Yeah, they like, they, all you can eat it. And it was like clearly not priced high enough. And now they, I think, are filing for bankruptcy. Because people just ate them out of house and shrimp. Those shrimps are taking the lobsters down. Okay. Red Lobster, our condolences. We also. Maybe fact check that, but. <laughs> well, I don't think anybody trusts <laughs> that you're spitting out facts about Red Lobster Lynn, so I think we're okay. Um, we also love Pazookis by 
Fact check, it's true. We have a Yahoo article. Red Lobster heading bankruptcy, losing. Dot, dot, dot. Uh, okay, Lynn, <laughs> backtrack. What's your good vibe? Pazookies? Oh my gosh, another food. Yeah, I know. <laughs> another food. Good vibe, shocker. I think my good vibe, because my family is here, is just call somebody that you know is going to give you good good feelings i feel like sometimes it feels like a hassle to like because your life is so busy and you're like oh i know i need to check up on this person i need to call this friend and it sometimes it feels like a chore but every time i do it and i get off the phone i feel I so much more fulfilled and like happy so that would be my my good vibe slash challenge for everybody is just like reach out to that person that you know you need to reach out to and have a good chat. That's Lynn's good vibe challenge, which I love the re <laughs> the renaming yeah. of this section. My good vibe is that feeling like when you're on a bicycle and you're it's warm out and the wind is whipping at you and the sun is out and like you see the trees and you get fresh air and you're just pedaling your little legs and it's just such a lovely free feeling like you're being a little kid again. Wow. And how's the weather? It's good. It's warming up. Like I said, it's becoming warmer. It's hot today. The flowers are out. That's why I said you should get tulips because the tulips are out. The tulips are out. Good vibes. Okay, that's it for this week's crazy episode of Good Vibes FC. Are you subscribed yet? If not, make sure you subscribe to this podcast feed right now, you little butterscotch pudding pop. It's available wherever you listen to podcasts. We are also on YouTube. We're also all over social media at Women's Game MIB. You all know the drill. This week coming up, we have an interview with Alex Greenwood from Manchester City. We talk all about our time together there. We talk about her journey with her club teams, her Euros win with the England's Lionesses, and we play a game called So You Think You Know Scouse. Get that episode Thursday morning on our podcast feed. All right, everybody, we will leave you now. Goodbye. I'm Lynn Williams. And I'm Sam Mewis, and this is Good Vibes FC, the podcast that's basically the Spider-Man of podcasts because we're kind of Tom Holland in Zendaya. But also Adam Sandler in Zendaya. And if you know, you know. Okay, love you. Bye. Bye.